don't um, try and start a tech company with your flatmate in the lounge. But one day you'll look back and go, wow, that chocolate thing was a real strategic thing to do before becoming the Minister of Education. <laughs> <laughs> Hose down cow asses at five o'clock in the morning. I can't believe it took you so long to get to this point. Chocolate was probably up there with that. <laughs> I saw the sign. Twice is two weeks in creative endeavour and it delves into the stories, insights and journeys to now of social enterprises, creatives and innovators from Wellington, New Zealand every two weeks. I'm your co-host, David Binstead. Episode 45 co-host, general manager of Pomegranate Kitchen, all round lovely human being, I'm smiling at her across the seat, and also becoming quite the regular fixture is the genuine delight who is Beck Stewart. How the hell are you today? I'm really good, thank you. Um, I'm tired because uh, last night I went to the first meeting of um, the TED speakers, so I'm doing a TED talk. In Spoiler about, alert. I know, they're <laughs> announcing it tomorrow. I'm doing a TED talk in about six weeks, and so I did three hours of that, and then I went out for two beers after that. So um, yeah, I'm a little bit sleepy, but and we're you know we're in this cosy pod, but we've got some interesting people here today, so I'm feeling excited. We're really grateful for episode support from BizDojo, co-work countrywide, Collider Wellington, where innovation, tech and creative scenes converge, our Patreon patrons, and also Garage Project for independent craft beer support. We got us some guests. Our first guest is someone driven by action and compassion, leading by doing and then helping the other humans do it too. From teaching in West Africa to dreaming big and driving the details at Inspiral and Dev Academy here in Wellington. Event organiser, thought leader, facilitator and baker of sourdough. Two weeks in creative endeavour, pleased to welcome Sylvia Zua. It sounds so strange when you hear yourself spoken about. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much for that lovely intro. You're too kind. <laughs> and um, Palmerston North moulded our second guest, sometimes learning about media and marketing while he organised parties and people. Ex-Melbourne ad man, or should that be madman? travel writer and then loyalty scheme marketer. He's invested his last six years making Inspiral a thing, alongside other things. Hobbies wise, he's a dedicated whiteboarder, with his travel heart and stomach lost to Asia and cheap fried chicken respectively. Two weeks in creative endeavour, really pleased to welcome the eternal optimist who is Anthony Cabral. (laughs) It is weird, eh? (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, that's great. It's nice to be here. I actually stalked your CV website and got some stuff from there. That was such an interesting way to do it. I've owned sylviazur.com for about six years and never got the courage to put it out. And finally launched it a couple of months ago. Wow, it's looking amazing. Oh, thank you. (laughs) So you do do some writing. (laughs) It was um, was actually crowdsourced. I emailed a whole lot of friends and were like, could you come up with three words about me? And I mainly used all of those words to describe the whole thing. (laughs) Hey, so talk to us a little bit about sourdough. First fun fact, my last name actually means sour. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) In Dutch. So um, perhaps I was born with it. Does your first name mean dough? Unfortunately not. But um, queen of the forest, if you want to know. Aww. So I'm a sour queen of the forest. Oh, I, I don't love know. that. Anyway, segue, sorry. <laughs> I just wish we had sour queen of the forest for the intro. <laughs> I will remember that. That's great. <laughs> um, but I would actually um, give all of my gratitude to any bread making abilities I would have to my mum. She is a master bread baker. But I think the key thing for me with sourdough is to keep it simple. I'd always thought that I never could bake bread up to the level that mum does. And then I was like, God damn it, it's actually way cheaper. It's really easy. You just keep the bug. I keep it in the fridge so you don't have to feed it. And then you can just stir it up with the flour in the morning, the evening, and then you bake it the next morning. And it's just really easy. If anyone wants my sourdough recipe, I did put it on my website. That was my goal, that people could go to my website and learn stuff. So there's all my favorite recipes are on there because I do like to cook. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, Sylvia's a good cook. Well, Anne's has a slightly higher spicy palate than I do. Hey, uh, I've got a quick open for you, Anne's. Um, do you think whiteboarding should be an extreme sport? <laughs> <laughs> Depends how high you are at the time. Yeah. Just, <laughs> and just define for the listener what whiteboarding is, because it does sound quite like an extreme yeah, sport, I doesn't it? Yeah, I guess it does. No, it's not that glamorous. It's like... So part of the whole... Um, maybe, yeah, you could. I could frame it as an extreme sport. Why not? Um, <laughs> part of the, of the last few years of building companies and doing Inspiral stuff has meant a pretty like full immersion sort of way of living. So having a whiteboard up in the room is, is a relatively normal thing. 
So I used to call it like the portal and then the portal would open and then all of a sudden there'd be all these ideas and connections and things and they'd turn into to-do lists and stuff would happen. I sort of want to ask you what is Inspiral, but before I do, I've got a little quiz for you. Is Inspiral a club? It depends if you want it to be a club. Is it a meetup? We've had meetups. Is it a fruit? Not that I'm aware of. It's a little bit fruity though. It does have seeds. Is it a physical place or is it in our hearts all along? I think it depends who you ask. I'd probably say it's both of those things. We're no closer to knowing what it is. You're both, in effect, co-founders for Inspiral. What is Inspiral? I would unbundle it as three things. <laughs> One, it's a community of people. And so that's the sort of relational stuff. Maybe that's the heart stuff. But it's people who give a shit about each other and have um, worked together, lived together, cared about the same things for long enough to genuinely have a shared sense of coherence around this community. Um, and then at a real practical, sort of legal, on paper level, it's a bunch of companies. Some of which have Inspiral in the name, some of which don't. Some of which have a formal agreement to another company with Inspiral in the name, some of which don't. Um, but that's all held together by the community. You make it easy on yourselves, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was definitely not top-down planned. The whole thing has been rel- pretty emergent, um, with elements of planning along the way. Uh, and then the third part, I'd say, is like, I use the word platform, but it's effectively a tool or a mechanism in which you can use to support yourself to do whatever the hell you want, as long as it's sort of got the the good vibes of the community around it and it's responsible and makes sense and legal and all that kind of stuff. So it's a community of people building a bunch of companies to create a platform to do more good. Uh, we had uh, Ants Rowan on from Inspiral Accounting way, way, way back when and I asked him a similar question. He said, I'll just ask these two. And so I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really stoked to, to finally be sitting around chatting into the mics with you about it. Ants Rohan, if you're listening to this, that is a cop out. <laughs> <laughs> So, after a definition, just tell us what what a normal week looks like, if there is such a thing, Sylvia. My work over the last six years has been mainly within the Inspiral Network, um, working with different organisations and really trying to make things and people thrive. My work is often about helping, supporting people in whatever way matters. So right now, that is, I do a lot of work with Dev Academy, I guess you could say in an operations manager role, but I also work with Josh and Ro, who are the co-founders. Inspiral tends to be like a leech of stuff that we like and we kind of invert it and apply it as we want to for kind of I guess positive social impact we go right okay finances budget how the hell does the world do it actually that's a bit shit because the CFO is making the decision and then everyone else has to follow the decisions how might we use budgeting and make it a little bit better and so we've tried to do that across organisational structures but also in different sectors. So Dev Academy in terms of and a developers academy or what we're trying to do with Chalkle in terms of education or in terms of running software systems or tech teams, we're always going, right, how does the world do it? How can we optimise it? And then I guess the final step I would say is also how can we open source it? There's as many stories of Inspiral in Wellington as there have been interactions, but what we're noticing overseas is it's our focus on open sourcing our work, our focus on sharing the stories when they're only half built, that overseas people are starting to copy, and that's where I think the real impact of Inspiral is. And that's kind of the beauty of Wellington as well. We're almost like a little petri tray. We can try a whole lot of stuff, but if we keep it as a group of predominantly, you know, middle class, generally white, 30 to 35 year old people having a great time, that's not going to create the impact that at least I want to see in the world. So you, you talk about the, the non-hierarchical nature and, you know, the challenges of being in, um, in Wellington and having these kind of preconceived notions of what you are. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the challenges just of setting up Inspiral and of keeping it going? Well, I guess it's like Ant said is, I mean, Joshua Vial started it and I think um, there's an incredible way that he built it of really putting out a vision there and not saying, here's an organisation, you're going to be the HR manager, you're going to do the accounts and you're going to do this. But instead going, how might we, I guess in Josh's language, turn a trickle of human energy into a river solving the greatest problems of our time. (laughs) I think the best metaphor. But I think it was that that got a whole lot of people together and initially then we built it up over relationships from there. 
I don't know. What would you say? I'd say also just solving the problems that needed to be solved at the time. And the first problem was like, hey, we've got a bunch of people who are really keen. How do we organize them to work collaboratively together? And then it was like, hey, we've got a bunch of startups. Um, how do we organize them to like have some sort of collaborative function and work together? And so it sort of has evolved from there. And I don't, I would say there's no one in the network that has seen what we've got now coming. About two or three years ago, when we were having these quite strong cultural retreats, I was like, man, I know what we're going to do. We're going to have John Lemon, who was a good friend and musician um, and an Inspiral member at the time. We're going to have John Lemon play in the art gallery and it's going to be amazing. And that's going to be like this big Inspiral thing. That's And I had this sort of like, I just want that to happen sort of vision thing. And then that did happen, but it happened in a context of a giant conference that we ran at the Michael Fowler Center with like um, GitHub speaking and it was the first OSOS conference. And so it was sort of like this thing where maybe quite a few people with very clear visions of something came together and created this big giant or much larger than any one of those things vision. Just um, give listeners a quick summary of what OSOS is. Uh, So OSOS is a conference that Sylvia and I have run together for the last couple of years. the sort of basic fundamental premise was how can we take the the tools and processes from the open source software movement and apply them to wider business and democracy thinking. Um, so we, re- we ran a conference at the Michael Fowler Center last year and the year before, about four or 500 people, um, just different speakers from across business and democratic movements and software technology and mushed them all together and talked about all sorts of stuff. And drank beer? Uh, there, was, there was definitely beer drunk, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Good just, couple of just, after parties. Just checking, just checking, like got to have that balance. I think there's something though what Anne said of solving the problems as they turn up is what makes Inspiral unique and also jumping at opportunities. So OSOS was kind of a curveball that was thrown at us and the world, my life, our life might have been a whole lot easier just to go, nah, it's someone else's. <clears throat> but we picked it up, did what we could do with it and I think the growth of Inspiral has been like, right, how are we going to deal with decision making? How are we going to do with that? And right now, one of the key questions is how do you do governance? Like, what is the role of governance in a decentralized organization that can't even quite agree on its purpose, but is kind of doing a whole lot of shit, you know, in terms of that real typical sort of spider organization? Where the hell is the, is the collective brain or the central brain or mm. what does that look like? Bottom up governance. What does that look like? Exactly. And I don't see anywhere in the world that's doing it. I would love if anyone listening to this has got an awesome example of where governance fulfills a role of empowering the people rather than this being this like freak out monthly report that people need to write to the board of directors. Like that's what I'm interested in right now at least. I think that good governance does like enable people on the ground to work. Often it is that kind of someone that's potentially more experienced or, um, you know, has been in a sector for a long time and it's kind of giving handing down the knowledge um, and, and how to kind of decentralise that. And, and here's me sitting there going, how the hell do they work out their three-year plans? Well, they don't have any. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ta-da. I set it up. You knock it in for me. Back. Yeah, actually, when I um, wrote that post about what is in Spiral, I sort of just roughly just said, here's some stuff that we've done in the last three years. And I was like, man, there's no way, absolutely no way that I can think of any organisation with the basically no resources that we had um, to have set a plan like that and achieve that stuff. Like it was just a bunch of emergent things. Companies started, projects started, collaborations with central and local government started, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, Totally, totally not a top-down plan, just a like a bunch of bottom-up energy and intrinsic motivation and people getting to know each other along the way and then becoming flatmates and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we might do is we'll just crack into beer number one. Oh, got us a fruity one. I'm not much of a beer drinker. Okay, I'm far more a wine drinker. I um, but I drank far too much cheap white wine at university. I think <laughs> so. So I'm probably not the best person, but I will do my best to um, bring a bit of judgment to this beer. Yes. Prost. Prost. Cheers. I don't know if it's because it's like got a really bright yellow can, but it sort of tastes like lemonade. The first time I. I totally think you're right. Yeah, yeah or like a fruit kind juice. Of, yeah, it's kind of like a cordially fruit juicy yeah. vibe to it. Mm. I haven't actually seen it before in my travels around Wellington. It is a pretty awesome, bright coloured. I guess the logo is, I mean, the, the can is just bright yellow. Garage Project is basically all about 
producing whatever the hell they want to, whenever they want to, wherever they want to. It says, do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> it actually says that on the can. Like, D-U. Yeah, well, am I saying it wrong? Da, da, da. Okay, so we've got a brew, uh, which I've never drunk before from Garage Project, which is unusual, because I think I've drunk all of their beers, or I like to think I have, uh, that is designed for a football supporter. Yeah, yeah it and tastes like lemonade. And it it tastes, tastes like lemonade. <laughs> Do you reckon it's, it tastes like lemonade because, A, maybe, as you say, the can looks like a lift can, B, because football, traditionally a really British game, um, and they love those uh, snake bite things where it's like beer and cordial. <laughs> that was, that was a picture of David's face just yeah. kind of <laughs> curdling. <laughs> yeah, because I think be. there's going to be all these British supporters that want cordial in their beer. Yeah. So uh, it's 4.3%, 1.1 standard drinks for the 330ml can. Um, where do you think you might find yourselves drinking this if this is something that you would remotely be interested in drinking in the future? It Sylvia. It does feel like a hot summer's day one. I kind of, it doesn't feel that strong and like winter-like. Um, definitely not at a football game. I've never been inside, never been to any football rugby game. I don't know if I'm allowed to admit that. What, <laughs> about, what about that time that you were at the football game? Oh yeah, apart from once I might have been a mascot of a football game alongside the Phoenix mascot. I volunteered to be the mascot who was a, um, a robot. And so me as a robot and a friend of mine as the Phoenix Nixie danced on the <laughs> Westpac Stadium in Eden Park for a whole entire football game. It was the most hilarious thing I think I've ever done. You get all the best jobs. <laughs> you made a list of weird shit that Sylvia's volunteered for. It'd be a pretty interesting list. <laughs> it's hilarious though, being in the middle of the Westpac Stadium. So I'd never been in Westpac Stadium before. Apart I grew up from as a robot dancer. Apart from as a robot dancer. And the best moment was when... <laughs> Is that a compliment? <laughs> it's a compliment. <laughs> That's why it's probably. I don't want to put that on here. <laughs> wow. Wow. Where would I you should, drink this? I should um, endorse you on LinkedIn for that. <laughs> yeah. Actually, get the whole stadium to check you. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, they could all recommend me. Yeah. I got uh, a lot of high fives. It's pretty cool. You get to run around, be an absolute idiot, and no one in Wellington knows it was me. Hey, Ants, we should just roll back into the beer in terms of, like, you've said just like lemonade, mm. um, related to the packaging and labeling. I don't know. I think normally I end up drinking darker stronger beers when i buy them what do you reckon Beck? i'm the opposite i go into all these craft beer buyers and i'm like oh can you just give me the lightest thing on on the tap i agree that it has this kind of cordial flavor behind it which i don't dislike but um i think it's a like an interesting move for garage project this is one of the more unusual garage project beers of theirs that i've drunk because traditionally they don't sell light easy to drink beers they're all a little bit more involved and mm, there's, there's a lot more going on in every sense of the word what do you reckon sylvia three mm. yeah yep. yep. uh, mainly because i'm a little bit like you i can't handle dark beers so i would actually drink this because i just like it that it's just like easy to drink so i'd go for a three three yeah yeah how about you ants um if you take the assumption that basically all garage project beers are great which i think they are I'd probably say this is like a two out of five for one of their beers. Like it's not an awesome Garage Project beer, but it's still probably like a four out of five beer. How about you, Beck? Yeah, I'm sitting at about a three as well. You know, I kind of feel nothing about it, but I would keep drinking it. It depends if it's free or if I bought it. <laughs> hashtag entrepreneur. <laughs> Give me a free drink and I'll drink it. That's just hashtag human. <laughs> you never see hashtag human, do you? <laughs> uh, where am I going to go with this? I'm going to go three as well, I think. I want to take a short break to ask you, dear listener, a question about the future of work. Nobody really knows what the future of work looks like, but we do know that it isn't the salaried model of old, working for a handful of companies over a lifetime in corporate offices. One of the companies supporting and enabling a possible new future of distributed and collaborative work is BizDojo. BizDojo is Kiwi for co-work countrywide. From humble beginnings eight years ago, the dojo now has six communities full of creatives across New Zealand. Find out why your future and the future of collaboration looks bright over at bizdojo.com, which is 
B-I-Z-D-O-J-O.com. Our grateful thanks to BizDojo for their support of this show. I feel really bad picking on it, but the honesty and vulnerability that you've both exhibited with talking about your chokul journey, one of the Inspiral organizations slash companies. Maybe just explain what chokul was. Sylvia started a meetup group, and in that meetup group, she connected people who wanted to teach with people who wanted to learn. So, hey, uh, do you want to learn how to run a podcast? We've got this awesome guy, Dave, who's going to do a podcast classes. Um, Sylvia's going to make that happen. She just did that like 600 times. Uh, so it was quite in a one th- year. It was a thriving meetup group um, with a business model that ran off Sylvia's weekends and evenings. It was a it was a really big grand vision manifesting itself very practically. Um, practically being, it was literally a, a meetup community um, with classes on every week, with a growing community of people and teachers and learners. And it was sort of asking a bigger question about how do we do adult education and lifelong learning better in this world that we have, particularly in the New Zealand context where at the time the change in government meant a change in funding and we went from sort of a Helen Clark era to the John Key era and they stripped, they basically stripped all of the funding out of adult community education in New Zealand and we had about 290 night schools around the country teaching uh, all sorts of stuff, um, and also holding the function in the community of bringing community together. Uh, and that sort of crumbled overnight, more or less. Within 18 months, there were about 20 left. So that's like 95% of them gone. So that was sort of like a bit of an external landscape shift as well. It was happening about the same time. And that was 2012 to 2013, 14. Yeah, so we launched in 2012, and I guess in terms of talking about Chalkland as an example of Inspiral, you know, I went to the first Inspiral retreat and was like, oh my gosh, here are all these awesome humans, I just want to learn from them all. <clears throat> and then that was like, okay, let's start some meetup groups. And then that was like, wow, this meetup group is thriving. We want to, we kept on getting questions across New Zealand. Okay, we want to scale bigger. Okay, that's the next problem. I had never thought about that I would ever be a tech CEO in my life but suddenly there were some people that could build technology and I was like oh okay let's do that and then you know everything from oh my gosh I need to do my first GST return probably give Ants Rohan a call and go how the hell do you deal with GST and then oh my gosh I need to you know figure out bug reports and all of that sort of stuff and all of that with an Inspiral meant that we kept up and able to grow and I guess then where Ants came in is I would have kept on probably running meetup groups and just <laughs> died from trying to lose keys and trying to figure out, oh my gosh, there's a class of Moroccan cooking happening at the Aro Valley while there's accounting happening in Deloitte's boardroom. It was great because Wellington thrived, but it was just no future in terms of what we were trying to do. And so it was me in that year became the archetypal user for then the Chalkle platform. Because then we asked the question, how might we use technology both to reinvent, kickstart adult community education in New Zealand and solve two core problems, which was increased admin when you're trying to run classes and marketing. And so we tried to use that um, across all of New Zealand. We first tried like a social franchise business model. We tried having Chalkle champions. We got funding from UNESCO. We tried... I think we counted when we did that review pretty much seven different business models. Like we tried a lot of different business models and just, yeah, everything from commission based to like commission sales people to <laughs> just, and after five years, we just couldn't get it to work. It's kind of this thing that you've tried to scale, gone down the tech route and then come to the conclusion, this is in no way a comprehensive conclusion, but that you need the physical with the virtual. And that, yep, to be a tech company, and my real question is, do you now look back at that and think that was a mistake? I guess my version of Chalkle is the tech-centric one because, so I saw Sylvia as my flatmate running this meetup group and burning out and had gone through her first team at that point. And I guess shout out to Lightning Lab at this point. So I went through the first, the, the first Lightning Lab cohort in New Zealand as a founder of a completely different train wreck idea. Um, which was a fantastic learning experience. You called it train wreck. Yeah. That is really, really brave. It was amazing. <laughs> um, we don't need to go into it now, but it was it was genuinely amazing. Actually, Rollo, oh no, you, you Rollo really from, piqued my curiosity. Um, Rollo from Whipster asked me to be his marketing guy, and I said, "No, I'm going to join this other thing." Um, that was a real good career move doing that. Um, 
So after Lightning Lab and after shutting down that company and after, I guess, like having drunk the high growth tech Kool-Aid pretty hard, um, the opportunity, I guess, that we saw or maybe I convinced Sylvia of was let's scale the potential of the the underlying infrastructure of the communities. That, so we built one community. Let's try and build technology to support multiple communities so that um, we can have a more systemic impact. And in retrospect, I don't think it was a mistake. I think the thing that we were most naive to was the model that we were setting up was one that was basically a Silicon Valley style monopolistic platform play. And it's very hard to do that in a New Zealand market where the economics of running adult education classes are really tough. Like $8 yoga classes don't stack up for the teacher and the organizer. Um, $50 classes barely do. $300 classes sort of kind of do. So you can see why the government was subsidizing this stuff and you can see why there's a change in model needed. But if I think about how those models have worked, it's usually by a lot of venture capital. So Uber Uber subsidize their model massively and pay a lot of their drivers. Um, So if we had access or we had the capacity or Sylvia and I were the sort of humans to want to take over the world and raise that sort of level of capital, we may have been able to make it work, I think. Um, But bringing it back down to the problem we were actually trying to solve, I don't think we quite got it right. I have no doubt that the two individuals sitting in front of me could have made it work. That's like that's not even like a question <laughs> in my mind. Yeah. But I think what's more important to me to ask you is, what about the desire? Because you, you, Sylvia, you obviously had the desire to like, oh, this thing is working. There's the need. We've identified the market and the problem. We've got solutions. And Anthony's offering a great solution. And you've tried it. And you've tried it. And you've tried it. And you've tried the versions. And it just doesn't work. But the desire, it sounds like, is still there to want to ch- fundamentally to facilitate lifelong learning. Um, so d- does that sort of stick like a thorn in your sides to a little extent? A mixture of both, to be honest. Um, I think, so we, we kind of actually launched two blogs is exactly, there's the big sort of, I guess, analytical one, which we really put our recommendations and our learning in. And then I also um, published one, which was, I guess, more my own biographical journey of, you know, don't, you know devoting my life for five years to this bloody thing. But I don't have any regrets from it. I mean, I in no way, I never would have launched sylviazur.com if I hadn't done the chalkle journey. I mean, it sounds silly. I still struggle a lot with the whole fail fast thing. I still struggle with the amount of humans that get hurt during those processes. I still struggle with the ideas guys getting all the credit. I felt so many times that I was like, oh my God, I have no clue what I'm doing. And suddenly I'm standing on a stage getting an award A, I have no clue what I'm doing, and B, this was not at all all me. So there's something there that still feels confusing. You are such an imposter. Get out of here now. (laughs) (laughs) But I think in terms of the education, and I think in terms of the work, coming back to Inspiral as well, I never would have done this without Inspiral, point blank. And I think the skills that Inspiral gave me, where I guess Chalkle was the perceived business, but the real business was growing me as an entrepreneur. And I think my usefulness in the world right now is tenfold because of Chalkle. The work I can do in Dev Academy, the work that we're both doing in now other respective joint projects or separate projects, I think we've become way more useful as human beings. In terms of whether that's an education, um, I'm probably a little bit burnt. I'm like, I just don't understand how one makes a business model of education work. I guess that's a little bit where I look towards politics and I go, actually, education is a social good. It's a social right perhaps it's a human right, I don't know where all that all fits in, but it's like you have to have government intervention to be able to make education stack up or after five years you go, it just doesn't work. I don't know, that's my thought, thinking. Yeah, one day you? one day you'll look back and go, wow, that chocolate thing was a real strategic thing to do before becoming the Minister of Education. <laughs> 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 These guys always give me shit about being in politics. That desire thing, I think, nails it on the head because I think there's definitely... We noticed this even in our meetings when we had, often we'd sit down to a, a meeting, but we'd end up having to spend about 20 minutes clearing some Inspiral stuff first. Um, and so, the, I mean, we were building the nest while we were trying to lot, sit on the egg in some ways, because the context of... metaphor. Freaking love your analogies, man. Yeah, it does. It's how I pay the bills. So you pitch us. Um, question. That yeah. Was, it was very visual. I imagine ants just sitting on an egg and then trying to <laughs> build, a nest. build the nest around it. Didn't work. If and, and the clouds are actually whiteboards, like beneath <laughs> him. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> Us spending so much time building Chalk was in the context of building Inspiral, and I think that desire or the problem that we're trying to solve of building great livelihoods and to solve problems that we care about absolutely hasn't gone away all, at all. And so I think that's where, in some ways, for me, it felt like a very easy thing to do. In some ways very hard, but in some ways very easy to shut down Chalkle and move on. And we still are directors of another company together. Um, so through the work with Chalkle, we realized as we made that separation between a tech product and money, um, stuff that we do to stay alive, stuff that we do to stay alive looked like facilitation and managing conferences. And I coached the entrepreneurship boot camp with Vic Uni for the last three years and helped set up Live the Dream and that kind of like education in a different way since. So that has, out of that has emerged a consultancy, EXP, which is still very much a shared project with that same sort of intent and desire. And so, yeah, for me anyway, personally, shutting the lid was like painful and we're dealing with some of the debt and logistics, but that's cool. Um, we're doing that and moving on sort of thing. And still channeling that um, that vision and that idea, but a kind of in a number of different ways. Totally. In a way that pays, a, pays the bills a little bit better. Totally. And when you're all, also, I think when you're not flatting together, like I think that also makes a big difference. We had so much um, get out of jail free time maybe, or just enough context of like seeing each other, being around the same place. Life admin or logistics were low that it didn't seem like as big a deal at the time. How do you choose who joins in Spiral or do they sort of select in and how much of it is about the idea and how much of it is about the individuals? In terms of um, how people choose, um, I guess to answer that would be practically Inspiral is a limited liability company. Um, it's got a charitable constitution and it's owned by its members. And so its members are the shareholders and those members, they get to choose to become part of, they get to choose who gets to become part of Inspiral. And one of the beauties in that design is we've really had to walk the balance of individual decisions and consensus decisions. So it's purely up to my 100% individual decision if you join Inspiral. And, you know, I might be like, yeah, you're going to, you know, let's come join Inspiral. And it's relatively easy to join Inspiral. You know, it um, it's, doesn't cost you anything. You can come for the first three months and, you know, it's kind of, but to be honest, it's quite hard to stick around. You know, there's full information overload. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of people. There's no red carpet. There's no job descriptions. But if you stick around and if you then become a member, to be able to become a member, then it's a consensus decision of all the members. So I think there's something there that we've balanced again with going, how do you deal with ownership? Again, when I was talking about the questions and the problems, one of the tricky things with Inspiral, so all of this now is written up on our handbook and anyone can see it at handbook.inspiral.com. Some new people that come go, oh, it's always been like this. And it's like, no, 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 no. You know, we didn't even have a handbook a year ago. We didn't even have this process. And there's a whole lot of errors throughout how we've built Inspiral but that just seems to be the best way. And I guess it's that constant improvement that we've tried to involve in Inspiral. So we're constantly figuring out what we're doing. But I guess in terms of the magic. Also, because we haven't figured out how to make much money yet, the people who stick up, like show up and stick around are generally there for the right reasons, I think. Um, you're not getting paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're, if you're getting paid, you're figuring out how you're doing it yourself, which is cool. I, I don't know, like I think it's changed now to what it was three, four, five years ago. Three, four, five years ago, it was like, I don't know, the people who showed up and stuck around were just looking for the same thing, I think, in a lot of ways. Either like just getting through that quarter life crisis phase of like, need to do something that's not this corporate job. Um, biking across Asia didn't work. What, what, what the hell else can I do? Is this a nicer, gooder version of a franchise model? Because in effect, as a member of Inspiral, you are contributing financially to its future success. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also investing in the likes of scoop.co.nz. You are putting seed capital in place to help other organisations getting established. That, that is very vaguely some mm. of the model. Yeah, um, the franchise thing is interesting because I guess that implies that we could build other Inspirals in other places. And that that is a opportunity slash problem that we've been trying to solve and I remember there's some really good friends of ours in Melbourne um, who are like-minded who have very very similar sort of intent and organizing principles uh, and we had a retreat I think it was last summer or something and there's had this really weird experience of uh, a bunch of older and spiral folks fishbowling or watching these Melbourne folks try to figure out how they would start in spiral in Melbourne and then sort of 
like give them some advice afterwards and it was a really strange thing of being like how does this how could this even work or oh wow they're totally thinking along completely different lines um but at the end of the day like a year later another one of them came back and they were like basically in her perception of Inspiral was if you want to grow it, you basically want to grow a relationship with these specific humans. Otherwise, you're just building something that's like Inspiral and based off the model and not Inspiral. So we're still fight figuring out that dance. So maybe there's an Inspiral in uh, San Francisco, but it's called something completely different and it's run by people with similar values and similar like desire to collectivize and desire to solve problems and blah, 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 blah. And I think though that's one of the key, so when I say governance was a key question, growth was the other one. And it's really interesting because I can give you a really black and white answer of how people join. And most likely if you answer, ask us that question in six months time, we'll be able to give you a black and white answer. But right now I reckon if you asked any member about governance or growth, you'd get a totally different one. I don't think I would label Inspiral as a social franchise based on my legal experience of trying to create that contract. I'd like to take a short break to talk about those old chestnuts learning and networking. Learning is either rigid, formalized and expensive, looking at you tertiary degree holders, or as informal as Wikipedia and other online resources. Networking, well, its reputation is about as up there as a used car salesman. What if I said there was a place where you get to learn cool stuff and connect meaningfully with movers and shakers in Wellington's innovation, tech and creative scenes? A place where growing world-class future-facing companies is at the core of their purpose. Collider Wellington is where fast-growing companies and clever ideas come to connect, converge and collaborate. A packed monthly IRL, in real life, programme connects thought leaders, emerging entrepreneurs and inspirational experts to support the growth of the greatest little city on earth, Wellington, New Zealand. Best of all, most of the events are free. Learn something new, hang with some of the smartest people on the planet, and access world-class intelligence. For all the details, visit colliderwellington.com. That's spelt colliderwgtn.com. Our grateful thanks to Collider Wellington and Wellington City Council for their support of this show. Great. Shall we? Is everyone ready for our next beer? So ready. So our next beer is called Pernicious Weed. It's like one of those old horror movies. Oh, I should be concerned. <laughs> that already smells great. Oh, that smells, yeah, exactly. All right, cheers, everybody. Yeah, something. Yeah, this is more like what I normally drink. Yeah, that's tasty. So why is it tasty, Beck? <laughs> Don't know. It's got, like, really strong, bitey flavours. Yeah, exactly. It's strong or weak, right? <laughs> There's a great comparison with our first beer, the Gold Nail from Garage Project. It immediately hits you in the face pretty square. It's, it's like um, playing cricket with a toothpick, first beer, or with a sledgehammer, second beer. Mm, complex. There's no faking it. Uh-uh. Yeah, so to me, it's going to sound really stupid, but it tastes like beer. <laughs> You've been in Wellington like, too long. It tastes like beer should taste. <laughs> well, because I don't, I don't actually drink that much beer. And to be honest, like, this is actually almost a little bit too beery in terms of flavour. <laughs> Next time we go to Palmerston North, you can have a flat DB draft. <laughs> and then you can appreciate that this is not what all beer tastes like. <laughs> just, yeah, true. No, no, I, I really appreciate the honesty. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just... It, it, it tastes like beer, but it's beer on steroids. Yeah, it's, that, it's true. It's sort of beer plus. It's the concentration of what you may imagine beer tastes like. Yeah. Ants, give us a few. It's like um, what you'd expect a $11 craft beer to taste like. And if it doesn't taste like that, you're getting ripped off. <laughs> but it does, and it's great. How about for you, Ants, in terms of your current relationship with sort of alcoholic beverages? Yeah, it's definitely changed. It's definitely a lot more chill than it was. I don't think Ants and I would have been friends when we were at high school nor at university. No, I didn't really hang out with Inspiral types. <laughs> what, what is an Inspiral type? Come on. I reckon, so at an Inspiral retreat, no one's really drinking four beers out of a funnel in six seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't, as, I haven't as seen opposed that yet. to a TEDx event or something? Yeah. I mean, like, as, okay. opposed, as opposed to uni. <laughs> as opposed to Palms, Massey University Flats, circa 2002. Right, yeah. so you reckon that Sylvia and uni was like too square for you? 
or too like wholesome? Responsible, maybe? Useful? Here we are, crowdsourcing a job description for future in, in, in spiral companies <laughs> and, uh, and founders. And Sylvia, at uni, would you have hung out with Ants, do you reckon? Oh, hell no. Why? Because he partied too much. <laughs> he listened to angry music. <laughs> I played in a grunge band. <laughs> oh, what was the name? Three Grams of Madman. Anything online? It, we, we, I think our MySpace page may still exist. But now I'm a responsible adult who drinks... Who just funnels one beer. Responsible craft beer and, like, good whiskey when I can afford it. Hey, um, let's just round out uh, our brew number two, starting with Sylvia. Um, final score would be, if I liked beer, it would probably be a four out of five. It's what I imagine beer is meant to taste like if I were meant to like it. But because I don't really like beer that much, I'd probably more give it a three and a half. Yeah. How about you, Ants? Uh, I think it's... It looks badass, it tastes badass. I would give it like a four and a half. Mm. No, I feel the same as Sylvia. I will give it a four because I think it tastes really good. Um, but I probably couldn't drink heaps of it. Mm. Hey, um, I think I'm going to go... Uh, I'm going to go 4.2. The packaging and design I also really love because I can't decide if it's that... I, I want it to be that this is weed killer, this is so strong but also to kind of be that scary thing that you have respect for and not too much fear. Yeah, I feel I feel like a little bit like the university person that I actually wanted to be if I wasn't so responsible. I probably would have drunk this. You just feel slightly naughty. <laughs> We're really inter- interested to ask about some of your other work, which you've already touched on a little bit with EXP, um, but also the Inspiral Dev Academy. Perhaps starting, Sylvia, with you and the work you're doing with EXP. What is EXP, apart from being one of the Inspiral businesses, and um, what are your hopes for it? I think it connects back to what Ants was saying right when we were trying to figure out the future of Chalkal, um, when we realised that actually Chalkal was a tech company and where Ants and I, or where Chalkal was getting most of the money, was actually us facilitating and running events. And also with OSOS, we just suddenly found ourselves earning half our income running events, educational programs that we kind of looked at each other and were like, oh, we're clearly more successful at doing this than running a tech company. How about we put (laughs) our investment into that? um, Only if you measure success on the basis of money. Yes, but sometimes you have to do that. I've managed to almost double my income most years for the last six years, so it probably tells you how little I was earning at the beginning running community (laughs) education classes. Also, I think Inspiral takes up all of our non-financial success credits. (laughs) I I, I love that double of nothing is still nothing. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) So primarily, and then we um, realised though also, Ants and I, perhaps because we complement each other so well, tend to run round and round in circles, that we also invited a third co-founder, Billy Matheson, who's an awesome facilitator. Um, is on the board of the Inspiral Foundation with me and um, so he joined us so the three of us um, as directors founded EXP early last year and so I now run yeah most of my consulting through there Um, it's mainly around facilitation event management but also organisational design um, innovation sort of consulting Um, different clients include my old high school I'm working with right now, trying to help restructure, re- reorganize that organization. I've got an awesome contract at the moment with the Mental Health Foundation. Um, I did like Conscious Consumers Away Day. And so we also, um, Billy did a huge project called Data Commons last year. So it's a lot of work where how can we gather people, create them, I mean, sort of help them create awesome ideas together. Probably what I would say. Oh yeah, and it's, what's um, what's Dev Academy? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so I guess Dev Academy is probably another one of those Inspiral Cousin sort of ventures that started around about the same time Sylvia and I were working on Chalkal. Um And Joshua and Rowan, two good friends of ours, kicked that off. Uh, it's an 18-week it's an software development boot camp, nine weeks of online prep, nine weeks of full immersion, sleep when you're dead, code till your fingers bleed sort of thing. Um, so so pretty mild then basically, yeah, but really with, with a sprinkling of of well being. It's totally totally intense, but it's also got a lot of awesome stuff around engineering empathy and like a holistic curriculum, which is really cool. But effectively, it's a way for people to transition from whatever career they're in to a career in tech uh, within eighteen weeks. Pretty busy people then, aren't you? Busy environment, victims of our environment, maybe. Mm. But yeah, I refuse to say. I decided about two years ago that I was going to stop saying I was busy and I was going to stop saying, I was going to stop complaining about my emails. (laughs) 
And <laughs> How, I, how's that going for you? Pretty good. Right now I work with five organisations, so I've kind of got, I've limited myself to a handful and, you know, context switching is hard. You know, I'm switching between working with Action Station to governance roles with Lifehack to operations and like strategic stuff with Dev Academy through to client negotiation for EXP and questioning the future of Inspiral Governance, that can all literally happen in one day. So that's kind of, I guess, when you're asked what does a day or a week look like, that's pretty much what a day or a week look like in my world. It is busy, but I'd say full is a better description. And you have to figure out for yourself how busy you can be before things start not working for you. For the first three years, we were busy. Whether we were productive or impactful or useful to the world is perhaps a different question. And I think now, like, it's full, but I guess my own little biased bubble perspective of my own work is that it's more impactful and more strategic than perhaps I was three years ago. Do you think there's something in both of your personalities that um, is able to, that's really well suited to flicking between things really quickly? Do you think that's a personality thing or do you think people can learn that? This is going to sound counterintuitive, but I really, really struggle with the no strategic plan. Um, So within the context of Inspiral, the big Inspiral, I don't think it's been quite emergent. But within all of the work that I try to do, there's very much a plan. My brain thinks backwards from 18 months ahead, sort of thinking. So I, I like, I can't really function if I don't have that that plan. Um, and but yeah, you're totally right. It's a personality thing. You've got to figure out where your edges are and what you find difficult. Like I know personally, I find it really difficult to say no to people that I really want to help, and it often leads to too much transaction shifting or being a little bit of butter spread across five bits of bread and it just tastes good and and doesn't taste good and no one wants any of it. Make the bread much smaller. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Be more um, monogamous with my bread (laughs) and my life choices. Is that sourdough by any chance? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, they could be my loaves. They they don't rise quite that well. (laughs) Sorry. Um, What about you, Sylvia? How, How do you kind of navigate that? stuff that Ants is talking about. So one of my downsides is or is I've never actually really worked for a proper organisation. Like I've always made this shit up. You know, when I do a contract with a larger organisation, I'm like, what you mean you have five levels of managers? And I think it's about an appetite for risk. Like I haven't had a steady income pretty much my whole professional career. There's also, I guess, the I thrive on it. You know, if I have to do the same project, like I guess it's why I hate writing. Ants and I have complemented quite well in terms of that, like, I'm not very good at that thinking 18 months ahead. And I guess that's where then we worked really well with Chalko, is that I would have just kept on running meetup classes until I got sick of it and threw it all out and jumped onto the next thing. So it's trying to find that what is the opportunity, what is the problem that needs to be fixed, but what is the bigger, I guess, issue or change or theory of change that you're trying to create at the same time? And there's something about that pre-babies and pre-mortgage that also enables that risk. Cadulting. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, classic. Spiral has been my safety net in some way because I haven't had the employment safety net. For a lot of people, the safety net is the job title and all of that. But I think it's it's balancing that. And my problem is I start becoming a little bit useful at everything. Generalist. But maybe that's why the way that work is going, you know, to be... I was flirting with an idea of applying for a larger corporate and they've got this whole online portal that you need to go in and register in your CV and then they ask you to tick your skills in which departments. And I went through and it just sounded stupid because I was like, yeah, I can do financial management. Yeah, I can do HR. I've you know, restructured a couple of organizations over the last couple of years. And yes, I can do strategy. And yes, I could do product dev. And yes, I could be a QA. And then I was like, oh, well, I can do everything. But no, I couldn't actually have a QA role because I don't actually know shit about QA. But I've had to be a QA for a tech product for the last four years. What do you think your parents think that you do? Send emails. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to this point with my parents where they're pretty cool with it. They get it now. Um, it took a long time. It took a long time. Um, well, it took a wee while anyway. They're both doctors. Um, so they have a very sort of different view of what it takes to build a stable career I think they think I do projects sort of how like kids have science fair projects <laughs> shit <laughs> I think it's like that there's ants with his projects yeah Aww. how about you Sylvia same question to you well what do you think your parents think that you do my parents are awesome they've they've been quite actively involved um, my 
poor dear mother almost to her detriment in that um, she was a principal of a primary school for 21 years and then quit about two, three years ago and since then set up a catering company and pretty much caters for every event that we run. So it's been really nice to see, you know, she's an Inspiral contributor and see her get involved on her own side. Um, My dad has done incredible work in government for the last 20 years and then has also been working for WWF and I had this wonderful moment where last week he rang me up because he's busy negotiating um, some big thing but he was like Sylvia how can I run this one hour meeting and it was just this really wonderful moment when you you can see your parents starting to see you in your profession and go oh yeah you're the facilitator I know you run meetings I know you know how to do this and so we talked through it and we're figuring it all out so that was just a really nice moment yeah just seeing you as an expert the more question is my granddad and he's just incredible in trying to understand what the hell it is I do. Okay, Ants, can you tell us your first, worst and best job that you've had? First one was packing groceries at New World in Palmy. Yeah, you're like, man, I worked all Saturday and I got 40 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Gave up my day for 40 yeah, bucks. And then I got beers on the way home and now I'm broke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> worst job... Actually, you know, I remember the, the moment where I was like, I'm quitting advertising in Melbourne. And it wasn't that the, I liked the job in some ways, but I just had this moment of like, this is the worst. Like I'm using my brain for just not good times. And then best jobs. Um, I've been a teacher in Palmy and in South Korea and in Wellington, actually. And so there's something I think about directly teaching people. And um, I really love the work that I've been doing with Vic Uni and um, before that with Inspiring Stories to set up the accelerator programs Um, and it's really cool seeing some of that stuff and people going through starting their own companies or getting work, getting their dream job from doing these programs, that's that's a really nice way to earn money. Um, That's weird because they all seem like jobs whereas all the Inspiral stuff just seems like life Life. stuff, (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) but there's some good stuff in there too for sure. What about you Sylvia? First, worst, and best job? First job would be Common Sense Organics. I um, It's the only job I've ever interviewed for. <laughs> so I got that, um, yeah, I ended up managing the Wellington store straight out of university. So I just love and respect everything that Common Sense Organics does. They totally gave me awesome jobs all through university. And then, yeah, day after my last exam, picked up the management of Wellington, which was awesome. Worst job, I sold um, hair scrunchies, and I did a paper run, and I did babysitting. Um, I worked on a farm while I was in Switzerland. So I did three years um, working for an international youth organisation based out of Switzerland. <clears throat> and I'd do four days or three days there and then I'd do three days working on a farm. And probably um, the worst job of working on a farm would be in Switzerland. All the cows are kept in the barns overnight. So when you get up at five o'clock in the morning and you want to milk them, you first need to clean all their bums because they've slept in their shit. That's not that fun because you need to wear these huge overalls. You need to have the spray can out or just like the hose out and you need to like hose down cow asses at five o'clock in the morning so but I can't believe it took you so long to get to this point that's clearly the worst <laughs> Chalker was probably up there with that. <laughs> <laughs> in the whole amazing. scheme of things yeah. I, um, talk about painting a picture yeah amazing. Different, different types of pain perhaps yeah. yeah and best job now that's so cliched. I've just loved for the last about year. And to be honest, I mean, Chalkle was definitely probably one of the highlights. I just think it's hard to put in a best category um, because I guess it's a whole suite of things in terms of teaching me, stretching me, all of those like stupid words. Like it definitely gave me all of that. But just in the last year, I've just felt like, yep, yeah, nailing it. You know, when you just feel like what, what you're doing is creating value for other people. I just feel like in Dev Academy, I can create value in EXP clients, I now know what I'm doing. I'm doing some great work with, I'm loving with Action Station and with Lifehack. I'm like, yeah, I'm creating value. So I think that would be my definition of my best job. Upcoming, in professional or even personal terms, ants that uh, that you're up to. Flying to Melbourne next week to cut the ribbon slash sign the paper, start a company over there with an old flatmate. Um, setting up a t-shirt label with a sort of ethical supply chain and a bunch of local Melbourne artists, which has been a 10 year long torch I've held in the back cupboard that's finally out so that's cool and then working on a um, uh, we haven't got the title sorted yet but it's something like a future of work cookbook um, with a bunch of folks in the US and another couple of Inspiral folks 
uh, to launch in about September this year. So those two are really exciting me because they sort of hit the middle of the Venn diagram of stuff I'm interested in and that they're scalable and they are impactful in a sort of cultural media sense and they let me write and creatively produce things. Sylvia, what, what's coming up for you in the next um, few months? I can pretty much see my work life up until September. So between now and then, um, there's a couple of exciting projects on the burn. Um, one is that at the end of last year, I got extremely confused about the political system, thus my rant at the beginning, um, just going, what the hell's going on with some, you can imagine, some specific events that happened. And I guess I'm one of those people that when the world confuses me, I put my will where my confusion is, so I decided to volunteer for Action Station. So I've been working with them to launch um, Kai and Kororo Conversations, um, which is using an American platform called Civic Dinners. And pretty much the goal is throughout June, we're going to be hosting and supporting five or people right across New Zealand to host dinner conversations talking about the future of New Zealand. This would be my little plug. Check out Kai and Kororo. It's K-A-I and K-O-R-E-R-O. We'll stick a link in the show notes. So the Low Carbon Challenge has been running for the last three years so it's an exp project <coughs> and it's um fully funded by the wellington city council to run the whole program where we take six teams who are working in businesses that aim to reduce um, carbon emissions in within four different themes energy transport waste and housing is that right yeah so if anyone's got early stage ventures in that space, we take them through a sort of entrepreneurship program to test their market and also their marketing and their customer and all of that stuff. And the cool component about the Low Carbon Challenge is at the end of it, they run a crowdfunding campaign and every dollar they raise is matched by the Wellington Low Carbon Partnership. So this is a fund that we've just launched and we're inviting any funders out there to be able to put money into the fund because they will then be able to choose any team to be able to direct their funding towards that. So it's kind of a cool twist on the model where you can go, right, we'll almost do all the due diligence by putting these projects through the program. They've got to raise the money, which proves that they've got a crowd behind them. And so they use Pledge Me to do that as the core partner in that process. And here is a real awesome partnership fund where people can put money in. So we've got some awesome organisations behind the fund and we're right now trying to hustle to get more people in that one. And so that'll run through July, August, September um, through that space. So that's just two things. Phenomenal. Yeah, it's starting to think I'm not doing enough with my life. Yeah. <laughs> what do I do hey, with myself? Um, the spiral thing. You can have, have some of this Kool-Aid. <laughs> Have you got any shout outs for either individuals, people, groups, organisations, companies, causes that, that you really believe in? I've been spending the last sort of four or five months working with conscious consumers, um, sort of helping build out their marketing capacity and, and prep for their next capital raise. And that's an that's a organisation that I've sort of helped from way back. Sylvia, can you tell us what one object, and it has to be an analogue object, not a digital one, you can't live without? But embarrassing. Well, it's only us. We're the only ones that are ever going to listen to it. My so. craft, my craft box. Oh, cute! What's in there? I love knitting and sewing and crocheting and cross stitching, and I can't watch a movie and not do anything because I feel it's unproductive. So whenever I, whenever I watch a movie, I'm always making something, and so that's how I was thinking. I was like, ah, oh, yeah. When you said well being, that would be my little one. Huge. What about you, Ants? What analog thing can you mm, not live my without? My brain doesn't function without a notebook and a pen. So I usually have about four on me at all times. What about your drum kit? Mm, I could live without that. Yeah. But not the notebooks. Yeah. There's a notebook in this jacket. There's a notebook in that bag. There's Because there's notebooks, yeah. But you guys are all like techy and stuff. Don't you have an iPad? Mm, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not that techy. Not into it. No. Where can we find you, Sylvia, publicly, online, either professionally or personally, as you prefer? Well, something I prepared earlier, <laughs> sylviazur.com. <laughs> Yeah, that would be my own. It's still, I think if you click on some things, you'll still find a bit of lurium opsium, but oh well. I did see some of that yeah. today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shows it's a work in progress. Good um, old WordPress. I'd probably give then a shout out to the Inspiral, inspiral.com. If you're interested in the organisational design stuff that we do, I would say handbook.inspiral.com. Tells everything that we do. Um, the EXP site is just exp.agency. Um, Dev Academy is devacademy.co.nz and also Action Station, actionstation.org.nz. And then I'd also do a shout-out for Lifehack, lifehackhq.co. Um, that would probably be the, the core suite of orgs. Oh, and Low Carbon Challenge is lowcarbonchallenge.nz.
And on Twitter, you're Sour, sour Forest Queen. No, it's a little bit boring. At Sylvia Zur. <laughs> How about you, Ants? Where can we find you uh, online publicly? Mostly just on Tinder, I think. <laughs> All the stuff that um, I actually put time, proper time into on the internet that's associated with my name is all on my Medium account. Um, and Spiral's got a really great uh, Medium account in Spiral Tales, and my profile on there's got some writing and stuff I've done. That Hey, um, you can find Twice Podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Twice Podcast. And if you'd like to email us, you can find us at twicepodcast at gmail.com. Um, it just leaves me to thank, firstly, our supporters and sponsors, Biz Dojo in Wellington and Countrywide, our Patreon patrons, Collider Wellington, and also Garage Project for the beers supplied today, which we variously definitely enjoyed the second one. The first one, I think we need to be more into our football. But also to thank our guests, firstly, Sylvia Zer. Thank you. But also, secondly, Ants Cabra. Pleasure to be here, thank you. Or should I say Hamish? <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer to both, it's fine. Um, but it also leads me to thank my generous, kind, wonderful, amazing, lovely, thoughtful, managed to stay awake, <laughs> Beck Stewart. No worries, pleasure as always. Where can we find you online? <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, wow, well, I'm on Instagram. I don't actually usually talk about that. Um, I'm on Instagram at bo underscore wrecker. Um, that's B O underscore R E C K A. This has been episode 45 of Twice, two weeks in creative endeavour. Two each of guests, topics, co hosts, refreshments, and weeks. We hope you enjoyed the audio ride. A big thanks to you, our listeners, for sharing your ears, time, and support. It means a lot. I was just going to say stay warm and stay dry. Good advice. I just realised that Twice is an acronym. Da da! What? <laughs> Kaching! What? You said two weekly something creative episodes. Two weeks Twice. in creative endeavor. Yeah. Two's wi- oh my god! <laughs> Mind. I blown. didn't know that. How <laughs> <laughs> uh, many times have you? <laughs> I've been on here heaps. <laughs> what do they say about stuff hiding in plain sight? There best you go. Pl- best place for it. <laughs> that could be the <laughs> boom boom. <laughs> Drops the uh, that, mic. That's the last word <laughs> for sure. Sylvia, what's getting on your nerves at the moment? What's grinding your gears? Oh, do I just pick one thing? <gasps> wow. We've got a couple of hours. What's on top right now is politics. Um, and children in a beehive acting like children, yelling at each other. Um, I'm <clears throat> scared and frustrated that this year is the general election. It's four months away, and I'm like, it's a shit show out there. What the hell's going on? I don't trust any of the people. Um, it's probably on top because we had one of the political parties come and chat with us today, <coughs> and it, it just seems like everyone offers the same shade of the same thing, and I just don't... I just think we can do better and I'm um, I'm actually volunteering a day a week at the moment for Action Station as part of that reason and um, I, I, whether left, right, centre, whatever the hell, whatever colour, I don't really care and I really want to have more conversations that go beyond that and I'm really interested in how frustration can grow action and I'm interested in the people that actually want to do something and stop just complaining about the general election or just about the political system. So that's probably my rant at the moment. Um, and what is getting your goat at the moment? Sorry. Um, what's grinding your gears? I read an article this morning and it sort of threw my day a little bit um, in the Atlantic uh, about the sort of fine line between a living slave and a living domestic servant. And it was written by a Filipino guy who grew up in the States and they had a Filipino domestic servant when they lived in the Philippines. And then a whole bunch of stuff happened and they moved to the States and it sort of turned into this weird sort of slavery situation. And it was just a really, really well-written article. Um, And it sort of got me thinking and the thought hasn't really left me yet for the day about that's sort of a fucked up thing and it's really common in today's world. And hidden as well, kind of just like operating below. Mm. I got a little bit of context from it from family in Sri Lanka and just sort of have seen domestic work and it's sort of normal 
there's a there's a context in which it's normal and then there's also a context in which it's exploitative and it's a funny fine line but it's yeah it's sort of getting my threw my brain off today yeah wow that's really that's really heavy ah here's a good one for you ants the first album you ever remember purchasing oh <laughs> has to be the truth the first tape was Alanis Morissette Jagged Little Pill when I was like 11 amazing oh right that's a banger um, yeah that was great and then my first CD was Spice Spice World or Spice Girls <laughs> the first Spice Girls one any any songs that you remember that are particularly memorable not from that I mean probably the radio singles yeah okay that, that you're prepared to sing but the <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't pay me enough buddy <laughs> I basically right. wore out that Alanis Morissette tape on my Walkman. <laughs> I was pretty into it. And Sylvia, what about you? First tape or CD purchase? Uh, I think it was the Titanic album. Ooh, my heart will go on. Yeah. Was there anything else on that yeah, album? Yeah, I was just going to say, I can't think of another one. <laughs> just lots of dramatic moving music oh. that you listened to once and was like, fuck, I feel like I'm on the Titanic. I can't it's listen to this. Bummer. <laughs> yeah, so you'd have to skip through and listen to like the three songs that actually kind of make sense. What about you, Dave? Well, as the asker of the question, uh, the reason it's in the show notes is it came up uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I realised it was an album that my dad bought for me from like the local Cash and Carry. In, in London, East End, where I used to live. And it was um, great Western theme tunes. <laughs> oh my God, that would be incredible. <laughs> that seems pretty cool. Magnificent Seven, like, just like... Da, 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 <laughs> da, and just like, because he constantly used to watch all those kind of old films and stuff, still does. And so therefore I realise now you're kind of like, of course I'm not going to turn out like my parents. Exactly like my parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's pretty cool now, but I guess at the time it was a little bit daggy. I'm going to um, Joseph in the multicoloured raincoat, dreamcoat, jacket, something. <laughs> Technicolor dreamcoat. <laughs> details, details, don't worry about it. <laughs>